The first of our two Old Testament readings this morning come from Genesis 37, 1 to 4, and then 23 to 30. But the people of God hear his word this morning. Jacob lived in the land where his father had stayed, the land of Canaan. This is the account of Jacob. Joseph, a young man of 17, was tending the flocks with his brothers, the sons of Bilhah and the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives, when he brought their father a bad report about them. Now Israel loved Joseph more than any of his other sons because he had been born to him in old age when he made a richly ornamented robe for him. When his brothers saw that his father loved him more than any of them, they hated him, and they could not speak a kind word to him. So when Joseph came to his brothers, they stripped him of his robe, the richly ornamented robe he was wearing, and then they took him and threw him into a cistern. Now the cistern was empty, so there was no water in it. As they sat down to eat their meal, they looked up and saw a caravan of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead. Their camels were loaded with spices, balm, and myrrh, and they were on their way to take them down to Egypt. Judah said to his brothers, What will we gain if we kill our brother and cover up his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and lay our hands on him. After all, he is our brother, our own flesh and blood, and his brothers agreed. When the Midianite merchants came by, the brothers pulled Joseph up out of the cistern and sold him for twenty shekels of silver to the Ishmaelites who took him to Egypt. When Reuben returned to the cistern and saw that Joseph was there, he tore his clothes. He went back to his brothers and said, The boy isn't there. Where can I turn now? And from Isaiah 55, verses 8. For your thoughts are not my thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. As the rain and the snow come down from heaven and do not return to it without watering the earth and making it bud and flourish, so that it yields seed for the sower and bread for the eater, so is my word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sit. May God add his blessing to the reading and the hearing of his holy word this morning. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we are humbled to be in your presence. Open our hearts to realize the lives that you have for us, O oh Lord, one in which we declare the good news of your Son, and serve one another, and love others because you love us first. Methodist founder John Wesley was, 
but at least my organizational skills aren't near what his were to do what he did. But I believe that God speaks to each and every one of us. He speaks to each and every one of our souls. And some folks, depending upon the time of life sometimes, choose to back up these dreams with what many... <clears throat> there are people who would scoff at such dreams, being called wild ideas, or at an idea that may have never been considered before. <clears throat> but in many cases, in many cases, such attempts, such attempted setbacks don't stop the dreamer. About 25 years ago, I had the privilege to be part of a community in Gulf Lake. The healthcare system was literally at the bottom. The hospital had closed, uh, the physicians had left town, and we were left with the practice in a two-story house that my wife reluctantly let me buy to remodel into a clinic. We were literally like a little house on the prairie. But we knew we had this idea to serve the community. And so we put together a nonprofit organization of business men and women of the community. And then we started to plan. We never dreamed that our plans would be as they are today. But with those God-given plans and our perseverance and our former Texas legislator opening the right doors for us when he could, we have a clinic now that serves people for miles and miles around. And it's actually been doubled in size since its original size was put together. In the process of doing this, it was, it was in the fall, and I don't remember the exact year, but one of the ladies who was working with a clinic, in the clinic with me was at a football game. You know how fall football games are. I mean, everybody's there and everybody's making noise, but yet somebody who was sitting behind her recognized and she, this person spoke in a loud enough voice to whoever they were with. Can you imagine those people that are down in that little house thinking they can get Scott Wine to come and help them out? She said it was all that she could do not to stand up and not be the Christian woman that she is. <laughs> and later, and she knew who that person was, later when all of this success had taken place with incredible generosity by the community, she said, you know, I know it'd be the wrong thing, but it sure is tempting to go back and ask that lady what she thinks of things now. And that's, that's the idea behind dreamers. When, when you have dreams that, and you can come with other people and see a need that is present, that will honor God, that will continue to provide sources of service to the community, there will be people who will scoff. There were incredible dreamers for this church. When did, they, when did they first meet? Where, Clint? 1881, about three miles south, north of town. And people had a dream of building a church. And they started and apparently completed construction in 1905, and so we have the sanctuary that we do today. So people have always dreamed. And when God is at the center of those dreams, and we get out of the way, incredible, incredible. So what do dreams and visions do for the lives of we who dare to live according to the purpose for which we have been called? Well, first, being a dreamer, having a vision, it actually gives us direction. Have you ever known a person who is absolutely clueless about most everything in their life? Wives, don't look at your husband. Don't look at me, husband. <laughs> No, I haven't either. <laughs> Our dreams give us something worthwhile to aim at and to get up in the morning to pursue. Dreams are, they are like a compass for us, giving us direction for our life. And if you choose to move in directions away from your dream and God's purpose for your life, you may miss out on opportunities for you to honor God. Secondly, a dream will increase our potential. It increases our potential. Without a dream, by not listening to the voice of God, 
by not being aware of those promptings of the Holy Spirit, we can struggle to see the potential within ourselves. You see, our life situation may be such that we're able, we're not able to look our, beyond our current life situation. But yet in having faith to trust God with our life, we can begin to see ourselves in God's light and have greater potential and to be capable of moving out of our comfort zone into areas that will expand the kingdom of God, even right here in Blanket our dreams also help us to prioritize. Our dreams help us to prioritize our life. Not only are we given hope for the future, but God gives us his power to use in the present. A person who has a dream, who lives in, for the purpose of God, comes to know that, yes, there will be sacrifice that has to be made in order to succeed. And so many people will do just the opposite of their lives. Instead of letting go of some of the things in their life that seem to captivate them to pursue their dream, they will just try to keep everything else at hand just in case. But if you're worried about all the things of just in case, often your dream will take a back seat in the hustle and the bustle of keeping life's options open as the way of the ways that the world may return. A dream can actually add value to our work. For our dreams keep our life in perspective. They keep our lives in perspective, even though there will be others that will think we are just crazy. Our dreams can keep our perspective. Many, many years ago, when they were first starting the helicopter service in in Dallas, with the experience that I had in emergency room and ICUs, when I applied, they had me come in for an interview. And part of that interview process, the lady wanted to know our short and long-term goals. And I said, well, short-term, I plan to go to graduate school to become a nurse practitioner. That idea was just so new in the state of Texas. And she said, okay, well, what then? I said, well, I'm, I'm gonna go somewhere to rural Texas and serve as a nurse practitioner in a small town. And she just scoffed. And she said, well, in case those don't work out, let me offer you some things that we can do if you fly a helicopter for us. When I asked her how much extra life insurance they provided, she said, none. I said, really? I said, you know, a helicopter drops like a rock in a pond. And she said, oh, but think of the prestige. And I said, not when I'm dead. <laughs> so I told her, I said, you know, I think I'm going to pursue what I want. And I appreciate the opportunity and the time you've taken today, but I've got to turn the job down. And I was so startled by her, her response. She said, you are the fool to turn this down. Well, perhaps I was, but I'm still alive. So <laughs> that's what really, really matters. Just imagine, just imagine if Joseph had doubted it that his dream was from God. He more than likely would have made other choices with his life and would not have perhaps gotten to where God needed him to be. But Joseph began to realize that as those things came up, many of them for a long period of time, he never dreamed wildest dreams that they would come to the point to where the nation of Israel would be saved from starvation during the drought of the times. Did Joseph have doubt? Undoubtedly, I'm sure he did. Did he have long conversations with God? I'm sure he did, and I hope you all do too. But Joseph remained Faithful. He remained faithful. Former football coach legend Vince Lombardi once said, I firmly believe that any person's finest hour, his greatest fulfillment to all that he holds dear, is that moment when he has worked his heart out in a good cause and lies exhausted on the field of battle, victorious. 
think he was talking a whole lot more than just about football that day. You see, a dream and a living of life for purpose of God provides us the perspective that not only makes us different, but it makes our dreams possible. Finally, dreams predict our future. It gives us a mental picture in our mind. It makes us participants in the kingdom of God, not spectators. It provides us stability so as to tolerate the change, changing winds of attitude that do and will come our way. It doesn't mean that any of us will have a guarantee, but it provides us opportunities for success. And if we remain steadfast to the task at hand, God will provide and the task will honor him. Will Alan Drone Google? See, there was even Google before. <laughs> She lived from, from 1860 to September of 1934, and she wrote an incredible poem almost 100 years ago that I want to share with you today. An old man came along, uh, going along, let's try it again. An old man going a lone highway came at the evening cold and gray to a chasm vast and deep and wide through which was flowing a sullen tide. The sullen stream had no fear for him, but he turned when safe on the other side to build a bridge to span the tide. Old man, said a fellow pilgrim near, you're wasting your strength by building here. Your journey will end with the ending day. You never again will pass this way. You've crossed the chasm deep and wide. Why build this bridge at evening time? The builder lifted his old gray head. Good friend, in the path I have come, he said, there follows me today a youth whose feet must pass this way. This chasm has been a knot to me, but to that fair haired youth, what a pitfall may be. He too must cross in the twilight dim. Good friend, I am building this bridge for him. Little did Joseph know, as he spent time in that cistern, wondering, wondering if he would be killed by his own brothers, that remaining faithful to God, millions of Hebrews would not starve. Little do we know when do we realize what bridge that God is having us build through our lives? And there are multiple bridges that we build. Yes, we build it for the fair-haired youth that will come. But we ultimately build it to honor God with the life with which he has gifted us. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we are humbled with the lives that you have given us. We are more humbled when you speak to us.